Hey everybody, this is People of Substance by Lemon Skies and today's guest is Peter Lodge and he is one of my uh, favorite people, truly. Um, I should probably call you Professor Lodge, um, so just keep laughing. Um, so I've known Peter for probably, definitely over 15 years, 20 years? I'm not yeah. that old. Yeah, something like that. So, um, so yes, yeah, so Peter uh, writes books. He teaches classes to young impressionable minds. Uh, he does consulting. Um, he does consulting for communications, political communications. He talks a lot about ethics, which is, you know, that's a very timely subject that will come up. Uh, so, Peter, please say hi. How did you get, how did you arrive to where you are? Uh, and please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Peter Lodge. Thanks so much for for inviting me to, to join you, people of substance. I'm gonna I'm just doing what I can to lower the bar for your the rest of your guests, just to make everybody else look a little bit better. I I whatever career I've had is a result of uh, dumb luck and minor tactical errors. I just I seem to stumble into interesting things, and enough of them turn into to money and gigs, and I'm allowed to I can feed myself by doing what what I find interesting next, uh, including spending some some time working with you at MNR Strategic Services, where I think we did some good work together. We did. Terrific firm we did. With, with some good people. So. so before we get into the substance of things, and I actually forgot that you had that. So your background was voted, um, can you talk about that? Your book background was voted pretty highly on Twitter. Um, rate my background, rate my room. Oh, right. <laughs> on my Zoom right there. The books, right. So one of the things I'm much unreasonably proud, just it says nothing good about me or or the pandemic or 2020, um, is Room Raider, the online site that rates Zoom backgrounds, uh, gave me a 10 out of 10. So this background actually got an 8 out of 10. The 10 out of 10 is a slightly different one. Okay. Um, but that was kind of a, a high point of, of the, the lockdown for me, which is, again, nothing good about me. I mean, I I would put that on my resume first. That's just me. Um, yeah, we're just having fun here today, so that's. Um, so I'm really fascinated with you being a professor, and I've seen you um, on campus, which was really kind of amazing. Where um, everyone call you professor, and you know, uh, it's really uh, it's really kind of incredible. But I wanted to ask you: Is there anything about teaching that surprised you? Um, like, what are you learning? Like, anything that your students have taught you in the process? I learned a lot from my students. Um, so I, I teach in the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University. And there we have two programs, journalism and political communication. I teach political communication. And once you get into GW, you have to apply separately to SMPA. It's a small program. Students are really smart, really committed, really driven. Uh, it's a pretty tight little community. And, and I learn a lot from them uh, about you know, what's going on politically, how people are feeling in the world. They keep me energized. They keep me grounded, right? You have to keep revisiting the basics, right? Part of my job is to is to teach the fundamentals of strategy and communication, which means I keep have to keep reminding myself of the fundamentals, which helps me with my clients. But I also need to keep up with the research and what's going on and how are social media changing changing things? What are new techniques and new tactics? And the students drive me in that because they're they're working in it. They're interning in those places. They're thinking about those things. So I'm keeping up with the research because of them. I'm learning from them, uh, which I think is just terrific fun. And it, and it obviously helps my my clients as well. Um, I, I often bring ideas or client challenges to the classroom without telling them who the client is. They say smart things. I then tell the client and, and I get paid for it. So it's kind of a kind of a great deal for me, really. Yeah, and that seems like a win-win. What's the difference between teaching students and teaching clients? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, difference between teaching students and teaching clients. Uh, students are much more forgiving and patient. Um, I think with students, the thing I like most about the students, especially the the undergraduates, because the graduate program is terrific, but it's much more career focused. The undergraduates are curious about ideas. How did we get here? Let's kick things around, right? I teach a class on ethics and political communication. And, and a chunk of the time is Aristotle and Socrates and Machiavelli and Orwell. And a chunk of the time is, is frankly, friends of mine uh, who are lobbyists or speechwriters or candidates or elected officials from, you know, across the political spectrum. And we have off the record conversations about challenges they face. Right. What is it? Well, it's easy to say, here's what one ought to do because of a Kantian notion of whatever. But suddenly you're, you know, two points back 
seven days out of a really tight race. It's Thursday night. You're exhausted. Everybody's living on adrenaline and pizza. How do you make a good decision then? What does that look like? And we have these just fantastic conversations. We've been joined by uh, Danielle Allen, who's a political philosopher at Harvard, uh, remarkable scholar, popular author, who also ran for governor of Massachusetts as a Democrat, uh, dropped out of the primary. Um, she didn't see a path to victory, but she joined us via video to talk about what it's like for somebody who's an expert in Plato, whose dissertation was on platonic notions of justice, uh, who's a black woman, political philosopher at Harvard, then taking these ideas and her, her history um, and her, her family and then running for governor and trying to apply all of this at the same time and what works and what doesn't work. And it was just a lucky to be a part of the conversation. So since you brought up ethics, um, I know a couple of years ago, it, I, 2018, 2019, you launched a project on ethics and political communications. Um, so was that an idea you were mulling around or was it in response to uh, to some of the communications you were seeing and some of the dis discourse you were seeing? Uh, kind of how did that come about? Uh, it was in response to panic. Um, so I launched the project on ethics and political communication to promote the study, teaching and practice of political communication ethics. Seems like it should be a thing. And the question on the table is what ethical responsibility, if any, do people like you and me have mm -hmm. and to whom or what do we have it? And so I, I was an adjunct at GW for a long time while I worked on the Hill or I was consulting or when you and I worked together. And I would talk about ethics in the class because it seemed important, but really it was, how do you write a campaign, right? Um, I joined the faculty full time in 2017, part as a result of the 2016 election. And, and I said, I'd like to teach a class on political communication ethics. We, we teach journalism ethics, there's marketing ethics and PR and medicine and all this ought to be political communication. And they said, that's great. You should go ahead and do that. And so I, I went to Google and typed political communication ethics syllabus and nothing came up. And that's, that's problematic, right? It's a challenge for me because like, as you know, I lobbied for America's Funniest Home Videos. I'm not sure I'm the guy who should be leading this charge. But I thought this is, this is not good, right? We need a, um, a repository. We need people producing content, mm -hmm. thinking about this, writing articles. You were generous. With, with your time to join me for a five questions um, series that we run. We ask people like you, candidates, venture capitalists, students, consultants, columnists, the same five questions about ethics and political communication. And we put that up online saying, here's different ways to look at it. And so I launched it in part because I felt like it needed to be there in part so that I had content, right? So my students could go somewhere and learn things so I could learn about it but also to make it part of the rhythm and flow of teaching strategic communication, political communication, journalists would have a place to go, right? Beyond the, is it legal to, is it right? Is it appropriate? And so it was, uh, it's a mix of all those things. So I love that website and we'll include the links um, for sure um, after we do the live stream. Um, but you're like an embodiment of work smarter, not harder. And I love that about you. <laughs> I'm definitely not a work harder guy. I'm definitely... How can I spend more quality time watching soccer and lying in the sofa kind of a guy? Yeah, a little bit of Tom Sawyer there going on. But uh, but no, but in all seriousness, um, I mean, how I, I just love that, you know, I need some content. Let me ask some thinkers and practitioners and, you know, uh, random people like myself uh, to uh, to answer the questions and creating content. And now it's out in the world. So anybody who Googles it can find it. So I love and, that. And they are. They are the. Uh, I got an email from a graduate student at a university in Florida. I'm forgetting which one. I think University of Florida saying, hey, we had to answer the five questions for a class. Just wanted to talk to you about it. So I know schools are, are using it. Um, the New York Times has reached out to me, talked to me about Trump's email fundraising because they came across the website. Like it's it's out there. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's not you know, we're not going to change the world. The world political communication has been been a mess from the jump. Right. Um, Quintilian in 95, not, not 1995, but 95, complained about hack advocates, right? Plato made a pretty good living beating up on the sophists who claimed to teach the art of politics. Like it's, it's always kind of been, been terrible, um, but that doesn't mean it can't be better. And it doesn't mean we can't, we shouldn't keep trying to, to make it better. And so hopefully your input, the input of, of other people who are uh, foolish enough to return my phone calls is, is helping make things a bit better. 
So basically, we've not changed much since Plato times. Uh, you know, in 1946, George Orwell, in his classic essay, Politics and the English Language, said something like, anyone who has followed the matter knows that political writing is bad writing and is meant to give the appearance of solidity to pure wind and complains about the overuse of terms that become meaningless with their overuse, terms like socialism. So really, <laughs> we've, we've seen this movie before. Yes. Yes, we have. So you brought up soccer, Peter. And a couple of years ago, I'm just going to go right in there. Um, you wrote a book called Soccer Thinking for Management Success. So I'm um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Why soccer, you know, how, like, were you sitting at a, on the soccer, at a soccer stadium when you came up with this idea? No, again, this is part of my just ingrained laziness as my lovely young wife says i'm not burdened by knowledge so I, I find smart people and ask them things and then i take credit and get paid for them um i was when i was at mnr uh I, i'm a big soccer guy i'm a fan i yes. had season tickets to dc united from the beginning i play pickup all the time and, and when i was at mnr i i was asked to lead the media team the earned media team and um, a friend of mine happened to play for dc united at the time our local pro team here in town and you always hear that that athletes are good managers, right? Mike Krzyzewski wrote a book, and Alex Ferguson wrote a book. Mm -hmm. So I just emailed him, like, what makes a good coach? And he gave me some advice. Oh, that's good. And then when I went over, I became, and I sort of forgot about it. I then, uh, several, a number of years later, was asked to take over as the first vice president for external relations at the U.S. Institute of Peace, which is mm -hmm. an independent, federally funded agency that does conflict prevention, resolution, and mitigation. And I had a big team. I was asked to bring together a bunch of teams and do this whole thing. And again, I, I thought, well, I need to assemble a brain trust. And at the same time, this, this friend, Ben Olson, was transitioning from being a player for DC United to being the coach at DC United. And whenever we get together, we talk about art. He's a painter. He's a big art guy. We don't talk about soccer because you don't want to be the guy who shows up at a house. You don't want somebody to come to your house and say, you know, I saw your recent conversation. I have five helpful tips. Like that person's not coming back to your house. So I didn't do that with Ben. But it turns out the challenges he was facing as a new coach of a team that needed new leadership were very similar to the challenges I was facing at USIP. And we started talking about it. I thought, this might be a thing, right? So I, I went and I asked smart people. I interviewed Ben, Mary Harvey, who is a goalkeeper on the first Women's World Cup winning team, Danny Carbassian, who scored the first, first American to score for Arsenal, the legendary English club, a guy who used to own, it, own um, Ibar, which is a team in La Liga in Spain, people I, who play pickup soccer, a woman who's the captain of the Haverford team, just a bunch of people, what lessons they learned as players that they take to their organizations. And it turns out there were a lot of them. And so I had these conversations. I learned a bunch of stuff and found a publisher willing to take a flyer on the book. And then we published Soccer Thinking for Management Success, debuted as a number one new release on Amazon, which I think is is pretty cool. Um, and it's, it's available. So... We'll include, <laughs> we'll, we'll include a link. So, I mean, I would think with Ted Lasso, you should be enjoying a resurgence in sales, no? Uh, I, I do love Ted Lasso. And I tried, right? I tried to, the way you get Twitter followers is you engage the conversation and you, they, they don't care. They don't, they care. don't care. But I, I am looking forward to the World Cup. Um, there's a bit of a lull. My book came out right before the last World, last Men's World Cup in Russia. There are several of us who wrote books and the publishers were thinking this will be great. There'll be a surge of interest because the U.S. and the World Cup and the U.S. didn't qualify for the World Cup. And so well, women are, did. the women did. But this was time for the men's World Cup. Yeah. Um, it was me, Grant Wall and, and some others. Um, I timed it. My publisher timed it for the for the men's World Cup. So hopefully the men's World Cup is, is coming up in November in, in Qatar uh, and do a bit of a push do a bit of a push around that. I tried doing a push around the Women's World Cup because, um, you know, some really important important lessons in the book from women players like Mary Harvey, a, a woman who captained GW's team, um, somebody else who who coached her daughters and played a little bit of rec ball, but who was a big deal at a um, healthcare. She, tra she would travel throughout the world, largely in Latin America, helping hospitals and hospital systems get mm -hmm. better at what they do. So um, I tried there. I'm going to try again and cut her and then Maybe it'll be time to move on to something else. Um, so no rest for the weary. Um, you just, you know, you're teaching and you're consulting and you're speaking, but then you're like, you just keep doing more and more and more. So there's the book and uh, there's the ethics project. 
And a few months ago, you started a brand new podcast, um, Office Hours with Carp and Loge. Um, and so I want to ask you about that. Um, and can I tell you what my favorite thing is about the podcast? <laughs> Please do. Okay, so it's the links in the descriptions. So I legitimately went down the rabbit hole um, of clicking through the links. Um, and the one that caught my eye was uh, real estate in, on the multi-coast. So I don't know what the rationale is for that, but I was like, there's some really nice, uh, you know, ocean view properties there. So, uh, so can you talk about the po kind of the podcast, what the vision is for it? Um, how do you come up with the idea? How did you stumble onto a multi coast? Um, I want to know everything. Yeah, I do. I do seem to have a random, and you're not even touching all the random stuff I do. Uh, so it's, it's Office Hours with Carp and Loads, me and Dave Carp, who's also a professor in, in the School of Media and Public Affairs. And our, our the hook is strategic communications hot takes with footnotes. And one of our one of my big complaints about, about people like me who talk to the press is they're just going to talk. And, and a lot of what they say is nonsense and it's not backed up by research. Um, there, there's uh, Phil Tetlock, who's a, a scholar, who's looked at political predictions by political pundits. Right, people like you and me, when they go on television or the press, say this is clearly going to happen, are wrong more often than right. Monkeys throwing darts are better predictors. And so whenever I talk to the press, uh, which is you know on and off, um, I send footnotes, right? I'll have the conversation and I'll say, here's a link to a study, here's a link to a book, here's a link to a thing. Just that keeps me honest because I'm not going with my gut or relitigating the last campaign I ran. But it, and it also helps the reporter keep on us. So we have our conversation about 30 minutes about comms and guns, uh, Roe v. Wade. Um, Facebook has is running kind of a, a textbook advocacy campaign. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. But then up on on my website, peterloge.com, under podcast and also now a medium, I list links to Hibbing and Tice Mort's book, Stealth Democracy, recent studies from the American Political Science Review. But Dave and I are also pretty committed to the random. I don't know where I keep on a multi. I think at some point I was sitting watching TV thinking, this is crazy. We're done. Mm -hmm. If we sold our house, could I buy a house on the ocean? So like you Google ocean pro property for sale or something. I don't even know how I found it. <laughs> it's like, holy cow. Those are pretty places on the multi. Like I, I couldn't afford to move there. I couldn't afford to right. eat once I got there. But right. If I sold everything I had, I could live in a beautiful place without furniture or food. Uh, there was, for, for reasons that, that baffle me, not enough people know about a, a video that's a mashup of the Teletubbies cartoon and, and the goth band uh, Joy Division, <laughs> which is this, this amazing, disturbing video. So we put that up. And, and the way it happened is people would come to my office and say, we're going, students would come to my office and say, we're going to Professor Karp's office for office hours. You should come because they like to see us make fun of each other and, and talk about comms. And so I started, well, this is, I don't know. So at one point I walk into Dave's office and I said, okay, Dave, we're a couple of middle-aged white guys who aren't as smart and not as funny as we think we are, which means what? He said, what are you talking about? I don't know. I've got to go to class. Come on, Dave, think this through, think this through. And I walked with him to his class. I don't know. I don't know. It's Dave, it means we have to have a podcast. That's terrible. That's terrible. I can't have a podcast. So I walk into his class. You can't come into my class. Walk into his class. A lot of the same students, small program. So I say, Fraser Carp and I, a couple of middle-aged white guys who think we're smarter and funnier than we actually are, which means what? And a student said, podcast. <laughs> and there you are. The, the graphic was done by a student. Uh, students are threatening to sell merch online. And every other week, we talk about stuff and make fun of each other. And, you know, there's a lot going on in the news, so it's easy to pick on. And that's the... Yeah. And, you, and you have like a fun dynamic between you two. I'm not going to ask. So the graphics for, for those who have not uh, subscribed to the podcast yet, it's kind of like this little devil horns and, um, and a halo. I, I don't know which one of you is meant to be which one of them. So <laughs> we'll never know. Uh, but, you know, there is this kind of, um, you know, early on in, in talking about the podcast, you said something about the footnotes um, as in, evidence to back up what you were talking about. So talk about a kind of revolutionary idea that things you say actually have to be based in facts and reality and. Yeah. And it's not, just, it's not just fact. I mean, those are easy to check. Um, 
you know, how much money or how many, you know, is climate is the climate changing? Yes. Like here's the math, but it's also backing up assertions or saying things like presidential, this presidential debate will make or break such and so there's zero political science evidence to indicate that's correct. That's simply, that's an ongoing hot take that every pundit, not every, that many pundits repeat, but has zero basis in data. Right. And so it's that kind of, well, you know, here's actually what the data show. Right. And it's what kind of messaging works, what doesn't work. Um, we put up the last episode, which, which went up last week, we're, we're up every other week. So it'll be up for another week is on is on guns. And it's, it's after Uvalde and it's after Buffalo and and all the rest. And so the, the links we put up included one to a database of mass shootings, mm -hmm. which is which is terrifying. And we're looking yes. at it because it's terrifying, but also uh, on framing. All right. How does one talk about guns and what, what are what are actually the theories around framing, not just the buzzword around framing? What are some other evidence around around guns? And so it's actually the social science backing up our assertions and some of which we get wrong. Right. There was a bit of a dispute on forgetting the topic, but it was uh, a take that I, I thought was really interesting that somebody pushed back on on Twitter. So I just put both sides up like here's some stuff. Here's some feedback. Just. So I want to know that the work exists to back up what I'm saying, because again, it makes me better. If people look at it, that's terrific. Ideally, journalists will start saying to pundits, how do you know what's the research? Mm -hmm. Or actually the research says this. So have you thought about that? Right, just so make it kind of calling BS on things. Yeah, yeah, and making it like, ask a political scientist what's gonna happen next on political science. Don't ask a political consultant how smart he is. Ask a political scientist what the data demonstrate about you know, media effects or whatever it is. So I think this was one of my favorite conversations so far, uh, not the least of which because I made you giggle and snort water. Uh, <coughs> see, there we go. Um, so I think we need to uh, to have you come back and maybe both you and Professor, uh, Professor Karp and maybe do some hot takes. Uh, but I just want to thank you, Peter, for your time and uh, talking about your work and all the cool things you're doing. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, gosh, that it's always it's always fun to talk to you. I look forward to seeing you actually in, in three dimensions again soon. It's been way too oh, long. I'm coming. I'm coming to campus. So we'll be there. We'll be there to buy to buy the merch. By the way, <laughs> thanks, Olga. Thank you, Peter, for coming.